Okay, so the topic for tonight's conversation is from Pesach to Shavuot, taking control of your life. And the conversation really begins, this is going to get very annoying, the conversation really begins with a question that the Torah discusses very early on in the game. And that question is, what is it that makes us human? And you all know the answer to the question, because again, the Torah addresses it very on early in the game in sources number one and two. I'll read it inside. The Torah says, In the very creation of man, God fashions man from the dust of the earth. And he blows life into man. And man becomes a living being. Rashi, on the Pasuk, asks our question. Source number two, the Nefesh Haya. Af behema vechaya nikru Nefesh Haya. Rashi says, but one second. If you go back a few pesukim and you look at the creation of animals, animals are also called Nefesh Haya, living beings. It uses the same term that it does for people. Well, it can't be that people and man are equated, even though semantically they are in the Torah. So what is it that makes us uniquely human? Or is there nothing that makes us uniquely human other than the fact that we stand erect on two feet? Now she answers the question and he says, Ach zo shel hadam haya shebekulan. Man is the greatest living being of all. Shenitosef bo de'avedibur, because man has intelligence and man is able to speak. We have sophisticated thoughts. We don't only think about surviving, we don't only think about mating, we have sophisticated thoughts, we think about life, we think about love, we think about ideas, politics, concepts, we debate them, and we can speak intelligently. We share ideas, we share emotions, we share thoughts, we have intelligent speech, and that's what makes us uniquely human, and there's a plethora of literature on that concept in and of itself. We could have hours worth of classes. But I think there's an underlying idea to the concept of thoughts and speech. And what I want to add is that what I think makes us uniquely human is our emotions. And not just emotions, because as people, we have nuanced emotions. We're not just angry, we're not just in love, we're not just upset, we're annoyed, we're frustrated, we're disturbed. Those are nuanced emotions. And those nuanced emotions drive how we think and what we say. So I'm upset and a whole host of emotions are now swirling around in my mind and that creates the intelligent or maybe not so intelligent at times thoughts and that causes speech. So what I might add to Rashi is that what makes us uniquely human is our emotions that are then manifest through our thoughts and our speech, or maybe you could say that our thoughts and our words give voice to the way that we feel. So if I had to answer the question in a nutshell, what is it that makes us human? The answer I might propose is that human beings have, have nuanced emotions that then relate themselves through thoughts and speech. You with me so far? Good. If I had to ask everybody in the room, if you were creating curriculum for any age, elementary school, high school, you're going to teach Hamisha Humshe Torah, where do you start? How do you want to begin this journey of learning the five books of Torah? Now, I'm going to take the liberty to assume that most people in this room are going to start with Bereshit, and we might debate, but I'm also going to take the liberty to assume is that the overwhelming minority of the people in the room are going to choose Sefer Vayikra as the starting point. Bereshit, the Avot, Midot, character traits, the underlying stories, I can see it. Shemot, national identity, the Aseret Hadibrot, the building of the Mishkan, fundamental information. I might even offer Devarim, the 
speeches of Moshe Rabbeinu. We're standing on the threshold of Eretz Yisrael. The dream is about to come into fruition. I might offer Devarim. I would not offer Sefer Vayikra. Interestingly enough, the Mefarshim are of the opinion that the foundation of your learning of the Hamisha Humshe Torah should begin with Sefer Vayikra. All of that dry and archaic and detail-oriented book about Korbanot. Source number three. Amar Ibi Aseh. Mipnei ma matchilin latinokot betorat kohanim ve'en matchilin bebereshit. It's already assumed. Why do we start teaching the children Vaikra, Torah Kanim Sev Vaikra, and we do not start with Bereshit? Ela Shahatino Kot Tehorin, Va Korbanot Tehorin. Yavoho Tehorim, it askube Tehorim, because Korbanot are pure and children are pure, and therefore that is where we begin. Which is a very esoteric answer, but I would like to qualify what I think the Chachamim are trying to say. And for those of you who have been following the weekly Shabbat class, we're going to step back into that for a moment. For those who think that Sefer Vayikra is about Korbanot, you are sorely mistaken. Sefer Korbanot, Sefer Vayikra has nothing to do with Korbanot. It's true they are discussed, but that is not what the book is about. Sefer Vayikra is about what it means to be a human being. It's about raw emotion. And korbanot are a way of expressing emotion. Because you don't know what to do with the guilt that you feel for the fact that you tore the relationship with God. So God said, bring a korban. That's how we start to deal with the emotions. Because you have so much gratitude for something that happened in your life and you want to thank God, so God says, bring a korban. Because you're dealing with uneasiness in your life, so God says, bring a korban. Even in the bringing of the korbanot, there are emotions. The rich bring this one, the poor bring this one. Because when we're dealing with emotions, there are emotional ways of dealing with emotions. And then after Parashat Sav, which is the second parashat in the book, we're done with Korbanot. We move into Shemini. The sons of Aharon die. We're dealing with a man who is grieving the single most tragic loss a parent can have. Vaidom Aharon. How do you deal with grief? It's in Shemini. We move on to Tazria and we flip the script. A woman has a baby. The most celebratory thing a woman can have in her life. What does that mean? Her body changes, her emotions. That's an emotional time. And how do you deal with the emotions? And we move on through Tazariah and it talks about the life cycle of both a man and a woman. Because our bodies change. And when our bodies change and things happen, there are emotions that come along with our bodies changing. And then we move into Mitzorah and it talks about Lashon Hara. Let's go back to how we started with Rashi. How do we express emotion through speech? What happens when you abuse it and you've hurt somebody else? There are emotions on both sides. Aharemot kedoshim, sexuality. Do you get more emotional than sexuality? What can and can't you do? How do you curb the desire? And then we get to kedoshim. And standing at the center, barashat kedoshim, ve'avta alarecha kamocha. How to deal emotionally with a fellow human being? Respect. And the whole parasha has to do with respecting other people. Emor, last week, a man gets so angry with God that he curses him in public. Anybody here never been angry with God? We've all been angry at some point. That's a real emotion. How do you deal with it? Cursing God is not the answer. Behar, Shemitah. How about trust? How about that for an emotion? You really trust God? How do you deal with trusting God? When you can't see it, you can't feel it, you can't hear it. I want you to close your business for a year and I want you to trust me. That's a human emotion. Bichukotai, the curses and the blessings. Sefer Vaikra has nothing to do with korbanot. Korbanot are only one way that emotions manifest themselves. Otherwise, it has to do with raw emotion. The blood and the guts on the page are not of the animal. They are of you. Because being human means crying. It means being broken. It means bleeding. 
in the physical and spiritual sense of the word. Sefer Vaikna is about emotions, and so the rabbis say, you want to start to teach a child. There is nothing more important for a child to understand than the fact that he is human. And life will deal him many challenges. And he will have an emotional roller coaster. And if he's going to be a successful human being, he needs to know how to deal with those emotions. And what better way to learn how to do so than to look in the Torah. So Sefer Vaikra is a starting point. And it poses a challenge. And it really is the challenge that the Torah poses and answers. And the challenge is, will you be in control of your emotions? Or will your emotions be in control of you? And you don't have to get farther than the first story in the Torah to know that that is what we will grapple with as people eternally. The first murder that happens in the world is because a boy gets jealous of his brother and jealousy becomes anger and anger, anger becomes hate and hate becomes murder because he couldn't control it. Because the first sin after that, that is committed is because man and woman can't control their desires. God says you can't have this and they want to have it and they can't control it. The Torah is posing a challenge. It's telling you this is the journey that you will have as people. You will deal with overwhelming emotions. Will you be in control or not? And all you have to do is look at the Pesukim in the Torah, and I chose just a handful to see that that's the underlying principle. Parashat Kedoshim, source number four. Lo tisna et achicha bilvavecha. Do not hate your brother in your heart. Ochech tochech et amitecha velo tisa alav chet. Don't hate. Hate is a very powerful thing. But it has to be controlled. Because if it's not controlled, then you will do some very egregious things that you will eventually regret. You need to be in control. Parashat Kedushim, not here. Loti kom loti tor. Somebody wrongs you. I want to take revenge. Natural human response. Torah says it's not allowed. You have to live with an open heart. Be in control of your emotions. Famous pasuk, the mantra of the Jewish people. Loving God. What does love mean? What does love look like? What does it mean to love God? How can the Torah command me to love? Oh, perhaps it means that I should re relate to God the way I would someone that I love. But what does it look like? How do I control it? The Torah tells me. Don't be jealous. It's top 10, guys. Top 10. And it's not ironic that the first commandment, I feel like I'm on a leash, the first commandment is Anochi Hashem, and the last commandment is Lo Tahmod. What's the common denominator? They're both in here. Everything else is action. Don't kill, and don't commit adultery, and don't kidnap, and keep their all action. But what's driving the action? The emotions. You can keep Shabbat, it's true. But there's keeping Shabbat, and then there's keeping Shabbat. And they're not the same. There's not being jealous, and then there's not being jealous. They're two very different things. The book ends of the Aseret Hadibirot are driven by emotion. Because if the actions are going to mean anything, then there's an emotional investment and you are in control. Lo Tachmod, the Chachamim say, is the last of the ten on the bottom of the left, the left column. Why? Because they cause everything. You're jealous of another man's wife, so you knock him off, then you take it to court and you lie, and then there are children. There's all kinds of things that happen, but it's driven by unbridled emotion.
source number seven speaks to a greater challenge. And it's actually from the Mizmor that we read on Rosh Hashanah. You should worship God out of fear and you should be celebrating with trepidation. How do I celebrate with trepidation? Either I'm celebrating or I am in trepidation. The concept is the same. For those who are in control, you know how to deal with conflicting emotions. A few weeks ago, I was walking to shul with my son. It was the Shabbat after Yom HaZikaron and Yom HaAtzma'ut. He says, Daddy, you know what was so cool? That everybody was sad on Wednesday. And just after the sun went down, everybody was dancing. And I realized two things. One, my kid is brilliant. <laughs> and two, if you're human, you recognize that. It's an amazing thing. We could have put Yom HaZikaron anywhere on the calendar. It's true, we want to understand that Yom HaAtzma'ut comes off of the heels of the blood that was shed. It's true. But it's a little unfair. Let me lament and mourn and feel sad, and then give me a little bit of a fresh, breath of fresh air, and then let me sell. No, 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 no. If you're in control and you know how to do it, you know how to flick the switch because you're in control of the emotions and the emotions are not in control of you. V'gilu bir'ada. So I stand on Rosh Hashanah, that's the Mizmur, and on the one end I'm celebrating the fact that Borei Olam is king and I'm starting a new year and I have a fresh new start and at the same time I understand that that comes with a lot of fear and there's a lot of trepidation. I don't know if this year is going to be a good year. Maybe it's not. How do I deal with those conflicting emotions? Well, welcome to being human. That's what it means. There is no more difficult concept than juggling those two. The person who loses a loved one on the hag, that's an impossible situation. I can't mourn. Can't mourn, can't rip. The simha of the hag has to trump the loss of a loved one. That's an impossible situation. How does the Torah even ask me to do that? Because I'm expected to be in control. That said, it is customary between Pesach and Shavuot to learn Pirkei Avot. Pirkei Avot is found in Seder Nizikin of the six val volumes of Mishnah. Nizikin having to do with damages. Why is Pirkei Avot, which has to do with character traits and growth in the laws of damages? The Mifarshim explained because if a man is going to sit on a court and judge damages, he needs to be a feeling person. He needs to understand when, when you're dealing with a, a difficult divorce, when you're dealing with a lawsuit, there are human emotions involved here. It's not just black on white. There's people on the other side of the paper. If there's one thing you could say about Chacham Ovadiah, it's that he understood the human perspective of the halacha. What man was bold enough to be matir all those agunot? He understands his people on the other side. It's not just laws on a page. But that's what it means to be great. And so the Mishnah, uh, Prikavot, I'm sorry, deals with personal growth as I'm moving from Pesach to Shavuot, trying to refine my character so that I can stand on Shavuot and be a Kli, a vessel for Torah who understands how to be in control of my emotions, which is what the Torah wants me to do. I'm going to learn Prikavot. And one of the Mishnayot says, in Perek Dalid, in source number 8, Rabbi Elazar HaKapar Omer, HaKin'ah veHataava veHakavod motzi'in et ha'adam min ha'olam. Jealousy and desire and the pursuit of honor take a person out of the world. You can't control it. It will control you. Example. Source number 9, Gemara al-Masechet Sanadini, it's a famous Gemara. It's quite according to Pasuk. After this thing, Yerubam did not do Teshubah. So the Gemara asks, My Ahad, after what? After what thing did he not do Teshubah? 
אמר רבי אבא, אחר שתפסו הקדוש ברוך הוא לירובם בבגדו ואמר לו, חזור בך, ואני ואתה ובן ישי נטייל בגן עדן. בורא עולם went to Yerubam, who was the second worst king in the history of Judaism, the first one being Menashe, ruled 55 years. Yerubam ben Nevat is the second. He sets up idols in Dan and Be'er Sheva. He closes off the north and the south. He wants the Jewish people worshipping the idols, not visiting the Bet HaMikdash. Second worst king in Jewish history. God turns and says, Yerubam, do Teshubah, and you, and I, and David HaMelech, will walk hand in hand into Gan Eden. So get out of jail free card from God himself. We'll wipe away all the sins. Just do Teshuvah. What is Yerubam's answer? Amar lo, mi barosh? And God says, ben Yishai barosh. So Yerubam answers, ihachi lo ba'ina. Yerubam asks, tell me God, when we're going to walk into Gan Eden, me, you, and David, who's first on line? And God says, David is first on line because he earned it. And Yubam says, if that's the case, thanks, but no thanks. How does that happen? Pursuit of honor. Ego. Jealousy. I can't get out of my own way. You just had a chance at redemption. If only you were in control, you could have got a get out of jail free card. But you couldn't get in control. So it controlled you. That's Kina'ah. Gemara and Kiddushin, source number 10, as another example that shows that emotions can control you. Hanach shivuyata da'atay l'nahar de'ah. Askinu l'berav amram hasida. These women who were redeemed from captivity were brought to a home in Nehar de'ah, the, the, the home that Rav Amram owned. When they, they took the ladder, right, there was a ladder to get up to the second floor where the women were staying, and at night they would take the ladder away. So nobody would climb up the ladder and let themselves into the place where the women were staying. And the Gemara says that there was this one woman who was so beautiful that when she walked by the window, the room lit up, even in the darkest of nights. Obviously symbolic of how beautiful she was. And one day, Rav Amram, the owner of the apartment, was so overcome with desire when he saw the woman pass by that he went and he picked up the ladder that it usually took 10 men to lift and put it back in place so he can climb up the window. Rav Amram, not talking about Joe Schmo on the street. Rav Amram, he's in the Gemara. He's overcome with desire. He picks up a ladder that it takes 10 men to carry and he puts it back on the window and he starts to climb the ladder. He gets halfway up the ladder and he holds himself on the ladder and he starts to scream, there's a fire in the house, there's a fire in the house. The rabbis come running, there's a fire. And they see Rav Amram standing there, almost peeking into the window. They say, you embarrassed us. What, the rabbis climbing up the window to the second floor with the women? What's going on here? He says, better I embarrassed you now than I embarrassed you in Olam Haba. And the Gemara goes on later and talks about a conversation, so to speak, that Rav Amram has with the Yetzer Hara. Ta'ava! Guess what? It's bigger than you. It's bigger than you. You tempt yourself, there's a good shot you're going to lose. Because you're only human. And usually, or many of the time, much of the time, we're not in control. So if I question whether or not I'm in control, I can get angry and not go crazy. I can be jealous and not act on it. I can be desirous and not act on it. I'm not so sure that's true. Because emotions are often bigger than we are. You know, they say about anger. Speak when you are angry, you will make the, the best speech you ever regret. That's anger. If I turn the page, source number 11, we talked about kinah. 
with Yerubam. We talked about Ta'ava with Rav Amram. Kavod. The Torah says in Sefer Bemidbar, by Daber Adonai al Moshe Lemor, Shelach Lechan Ashim Viaturu et Eretz Kenan, Asher Anino Telen Israel, Ish Echad Ish Echad Mate Avotav, Tishlachu Kol Anasi, Kol Nasi Bahem. There's a commandment to send spies into the land, and they are called Anashim. And for those of you who are familiar with the semantics of the Torah, when I use the word Anashim or Ish, I'm usually talking about a man of stature. Vayar ki en ish. Pasuk says about Moshe when he's about to kill the Mitzri, he looks around. There's no, nobody here. Nobody wants to step up. Nobody wants to be a nobleman and stand for, against injustice. So that uh, Ibn Ezra says on that Pasuk, Shehem Vitam Anashim, why are they called Anashim? Shehem Yiduim Giburim Vichen Kulam Anashim. All the men that were chosen to be spies are great men. And so the Mifashim all also cried. Great men? Really? They went into Eretz Israel, God-given, promised gift. They came back, Lashon and Abba, Eretz Israel, 40 years in the desert. We lost the dream. How great can they be? What is the Zohar answer? They're Anashim, which means that they're noblemen, but it also means that they're people. They're human, just like you and me. And so what did they think? We're going to go into Eretz Israel. We're going to move into an agricultural society. The hierarchy of roles and responsibilities is going to change, and we're going to fall from grace. We used to be the noblemen, we used to be the leaders, we used to be the... And now we're just going to be regular guys. And in fear of losing their kavod, they spoke Lashonara, Berez Yisrael, to prevent themselves from losing kavod. These are the leaders, these are the tribe, these are the people. They lost control. Talk about Sefer Vaikra. When it talks about the Nasi, it doesn't say if the Nasi will sin, he should bring this Korban. It says when the Nasi will sin, he should bring this Korban. Because it's inevitable. Leadership, inevitably, you're going to lose control of your emotions. So we beat a dead horse. You have to be in control of your emotions. Because if not, they will be in control of you. So what makes me human? The fact that I have nuanced emotions. The Torah challenges me to be in control of them, and the Torah clearly says that if I'm not in control, they will control me. So now the most important question. Well, how do I do that? How do I stay in control of my emotions? Because it seems to be that even the greatest of the greats can't stay in control. So I go back to Sefer Kedoshim. Uh, Sefer Vaikra. The book about emotions is going to tell me how to deal with it. <coughs> Parashat Aharemot talks about the service of Yom Kippur. Something very interesting happens. There are two korbanot that are offered. Si'ir la Hashem and Si'ir la Azazel. One of the korbanot, one of the rams is offered up as a korban to Borei Olam. And the other is taken out to the desert and is thrown off a cliff. Very strange, thrown off a cliff. Interesting choice of worship. Pasukin 13 tells us, right, There is a lottery, which Seid is going to go to God, which Seid is going to go off the cliff. One of the Seidim is going to be for God and one for Azazel. The Ibn Ezra on the Pasuk writes, that there is a hidden meaning in this service. In source number 14, he is going to give you a hint how to figure out the hidden meaning. He says, If you can figure out the secret that follows the word Azazel, then you will understand the secret of this worship. There are other instances where this happens. And I'm going to give you a hint now to understand the secret. And my, seek, my hint is when you are 33 years old, you will understand. I have crossed the 33 line and I have yet to understand. <laughs> The Ramban opens up the secret even more. And he says, we're going to skip 15 for a second. Mind-blowing Ramban. Almost to the point where I can't believe he wrote it. 
16 that Amban says, Ani egale lecha ketzat asod beremez v'yotcha ben shloshim shalosh. She quotes the, the Ibn Ezra, Tedainu. V'hine ha Ibn Ezra ne'eman ruach mechaseh davar v'ani harachil megale sodo shekavar galut rabotenu zabim kamot rabim. I am going to open up the secret more for you. I'm going to take the Amban's 33 year old and I'm going to tell you what it means. He says, Hayu notnim lo lesamma el shohad biyom hakipurim. On Yom Kippur, the Jewish people would offer a bribe to Samael, who is the god of the demons, god of evil, so to speak. Right? They say the Malach of Esav was Samael. We're going to offer a korban, a shohad, to that demon, to that god on Yom Kippur. The Shelo levatel et korbanam shenemar gora lachal Hashem v'gora lachal Azazel. Goralo shel Hakadosh Baruch Hu lekorban olav v'goralo shel Azazel seir achatad v'chol avonotem shel Israel alav. And all of the sins are going to be on this korban that's offered to the demon. Anybody else uncomfortable? Because says the Ramban, they were worshipping idols. If you look at source number 15, it says also in Parashat Aharemot, and this Pasuk, source number 15, is 33 Pesukim after source number 13 in the Torah, which is the first time the word Azazel appears, 33 Pesukim later. In source number 15, the Torah says, God says to the Kohanim, and make sure the Jewish people no longer worship idols to these gods. To these rams that they are worshipping. And this is a law. God says the Azazel is the counterpart, is the antidote to this animal worship that they used to do. They used to worship these rams. And so on Yom Kippur, we're going to give a korban to the rams, but you just said to get rid of the rams. So the Ramban continues in bold. You got the 33, by the way? 33 years old is the 33 Pesukim. Sometimes I get lost in my own head. It's just, forgive me. So, 33 years old means 33 Pesukim after Azazel. You get to this Pasuk that talks about the worship of these idols. V'hineh Torah Asra says the Ramban in bold. Even though the Torah is unequivocally against and unapologetically against idol worship, on Yom Kippur there is a mitzvah to worship an idol to the ram god of the, the ram god of the desert. Sar HaMoshel B'mekomot HaChurban The ministering angel in the place of, des of desolation. V'hu harauy lo mipnesh hu ba'alav u'ma'atzilut koho yavo chore v'shimimon And because of that God, there is destruction in the world. Ki hu he'ila lekochve achere v'hadamim v'hamilchamot v'hamerivot v'habitzaim v'hamakot v'hibhirud he is the God of all of these evil things. Then the Ramban pulls back and he says, this is not out of worship. Let me tell you what this means. It's a mind-blowing concept. The desire of the Jewish people of the time, the single greatest flaw obstacle, misgiving, difficulty that the Jewish people have at that moment in time is worshipping this idol, this God, whatever it was. On Yom Kippur, you want to change. You want to know how change happens? Respect the obstacle. Because if you think you're going to change and not respect the thing that stands in your way, then you will not change. You want to fly a plane? Respect the lightning. Respect the thunder. Respect the storm. Because if not, it will win. So you're standing on Yom Kippur, you're offering a korban to the obstacle, means 
I am standing there and I am understanding what it is that I am struggling with. And I'm being honest with myself. I'm not the best guy in the world. I'm not. You know what? I'm not eating kosher all the time. I could pretend that I am, but I'm not going to change. You want to make a real change? Respect what stands in front of you. I don't eat kosher all the time. I'm not keeping shabbat the rabbi. I'm not giving all this that I can give. I'm not doing this. Acknowledge it, respect it, understand it, and then you can move on. And the same is true of your emotions. Respect anger. It's bigger than you. Respect the opposite gender. It's bigger than you. Respect jealousy. It's bigger than you. You want to be in control of it? Understand that Rav Amram got caught up and almost fell prey. God himself went to Yerubam and says, Yerubam, get out of jail free. Thanks, but no thanks. What's going through his mind? He's not in control. So if on Yom Kippur, I need to respect the obstacles in my way, certainly, if I'm going to take control of my life, I need to respect the emotions that can wash who I am away. I need to respect my own humanity. And finally, Source 17 perhaps said best by Shlomo HaMelech. Please don't sing. For all times and for everything under the sun. There's a time for everything. Know when to cry and cry. There's no ma'ala in saying, I don't cry. You're a human. Cry. Laugh. Get angry. There's a difference. You can get angry, but you can't be an angry person. You can have desires, but you can't be a desirous person. You can be jealous, but you can't be a jealous person. There's a time for everything. So as I make my way and I tick off the days, 1 to 50, from Pesach to Shavuot, it's the perfect match. Because I left Mitzrayim and I was physically free. And that was great. But it comes with a whole host of new obstacles. Because when I'm a slave, the only thing that bothers me, the only obstacle I have is the manual physical labor. I don't have time to think. There's nothing to desire because there's nothing to desire. There, there, there's no time or place for mental space when I'm a slave. Now I became physically free. And now I'm on a journey towards spiritual freedom. But now there's a new challenge. Because spiritual freedom means I need to free myself from the emotions that hold me back from spirituality. And that is the Omer. I'm counting day by day by day by day, and I'm understanding that while I may be physically free, I may very well still be a slave. Because if I can't get ahead of the anger, and I can't get ahead of the jealousy, and I can't get ahead of the desire, I'm just as much a slave as I was in Egypt. It may manifest itself differently, but actually may be worse in this case. So we started, what makes us human? What makes us human is the way we feel. And the way we feel is very real. And the way we react is very real. And if I don't take control, I may very well find myself losing my humanity. But the only way to stay in control is to acknowledge it, to respect it, to understand it, and then to overcome it.